against my goats? What does that mean anyway? What a stupid phrase. Uh, that bad, huh? <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody, to That Gets My Goat. Yes, this is a special episode, or it's special. <laughs> do we want to discuss how to do this? You wanted to just stick it in there with no lube. That's right. Just ram it in. That's right. Uh, I'm Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And we're here to talk about the D-bag experience. Now, why do you keep <laughs> saying that? Do you have a healthy self-image enough to say that you're a douchebag? Is that, is, is that D-bag is short for douchebag, correct? No, it's digital bag. Oh. That means that you've got robot testicles. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Really. And you only birth the cyborgs because of it. Ew. <laughs> now, you wanted to call this one two D-bags in a D-box or something yeah, like that? Yeah, we could call it that. What was that it you wanted good. to call it? That was uh, what I was thinking, something like that. Before we saw the movie, I wanted to call it Battle Shit. <laughs> because <laughs> I had seen that in somebody's review. Uh huh. <laughs> but I guess that would be tipping your hand too early. Could be, yeah. How do you want to approach this? Should we start out talking about D-Box or about Battleship? Or Let's just... explain to everybody how we got here. Okay. A few weeks ago, we came up with this idea. I told Rish that I thought it would be neat because there's the D-Box experience thing going on at the theater that uh, is nearby us where you have a chair and it has like a motor inside of it. And it's like one of those rides you can go on at some places where, you know, it moves around as the screen goes through. It feels like you're kind of like Star Tours, I guess, in a way, although... The chairs weren't mobile in that. It was like a big platform that you were on, right? Where you sit on this chair and it does things. It shakes you and it rattles you and it rolls you as the movie progresses. We, we sat on the preview chairs that they had out in the front lobby one time when we went to see John Carter of Mars. We weren't overly impressed by the preview chairs, but I thought, you know what? It would be interesting to see what it's like to see a whole movie and we could make an episode of That Gets My Goat out of it. And we decided to ask folks because we looked at how much tickets were and they were like 20 bucks a piece almost. So we asked folks to donate if they would like to see us or hear us do an episode about this. So we got the donations that we needed and we punished Rish by going to see Battleship because we didn't want to go and see like the Avengers or Brave or one of those films that we really want to see in some strange environment, like on a rocking chair. Wait, let me interrupt. In retrospect, why didn't we want to do that? <laughs> it's, it boggles my mind that we didn't say, well, we'll just go see Avengers again and we'll tell you guys how this experience was, having seen it once before. You know what I mean? Because that way we could compare and contrast. Well, yeah, I thought of that afterwards. I thought, you know, maybe we should have just seen Avengers again. Because, you know, at the time that I came up with the idea in the first place, I didn't imagine going to see Avengers two, three, four times or anything like that. I figured, like most movies, you go see it once and then you watch it again once on video. That might have been a good idea. Since we'd already seen it, and at the time that we even made the plea, we had already seen it, so we could have. But why Battleship? Like you said, about Brave, why not saying, hey, Brave comes out in June, we'll go see that, and we'll tell you people how it is. Why a movie... Okay, let me rephrase. The people that donated, thank you, but did they donate because they're curious what this D-Box experience is like? Or did they donate because it would be fun to make Rish go see something he doesn't want to see? <laughs> I can't say, but I bet it's a little of both. It'd be fun to hear you rant and rave about having to see this movie and what you thought of it. I think they might be looking forward to something like that, perhaps. I think the Battleship thing was just a joke to begin with. I told you, yeah, we should go see a movie in D-Box. And I said, yeah, we don't want to go and see a movie we really want to see because then that might ruin it. And then we'd be irritated. Maybe we should see something else. And I think, yeah, maybe we should see Battleship. <laughs> and I took you seriously? And or? then we wound up doing that and for some reason. Well, yeah, we, were, we wanted to do a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. And we had a set deadline. And in retrospect, that deadline was wise. 
because the reason I said it had to be when it was, was because I was afraid that if Battleship was really, really bad, it would only get a week or so in this premium type theater right. it probably and be pushed would. out by something yeah. else. And I, I think history of just this weekend has proven yeah. that it's not going to be there next week. Yeah, Men it, in Black will be there. It, Avengers will still be It probably be would have anyways. I think just in the summer, the way it goes, they probably move. You know, the movie only spends one week in the D-Box. Unless the D-Box is a thing that not every movie does. Like maybe you can't get Men in Black in D-Box because it was a fairly complicated thing. I mean, they weren't here we'll jerk you here and here we'll jerk you there there was uh, some more interesting movements than that for me uh, somebody just saying i'll jerk you here i'll jerk you there is enough but i I think the point you were trying to make is there's somebody's job to i'm assuming watch the movie and program the chair to accompany what's going on on the screen right and to me that was really interesting as we were watching it because there were times when the chair just went nuts. And then there were other times when the chair went to sleep. Yeah. But to be that guy who decides what the chair does and when and, and when it doesn't do anything, I don't know. There's something attractive about that. You know, Maybe I want that job. It's not going to be a long-term job, unfortunately. I don't think that's going to be around forever. Well, okay. I, I'll ask you what your experience was after I say this. Okay. Uh, if you want to go out there... And try out the D-Box. Be prepared. I mean, it, it, imagine that you're in a Lazy Boy where, like, it's it's on an uneven ground and it just it doesn't go back and forth the way it's supposed to. It goes in all directions. And imagine, if you would, a five-year-old with combat boots sitting right behind you and kicking <laughs> your Lazy Boy all the time. Just sometimes hard, sometimes lightly, sometimes waiting until your guard is down, and then ding, right there in the small of your back. That, my friends, is the D-Box so experience. You, uh, so that's how you uh, felt. You didn't enjoy it at all? It didn't then, enhance your experience of the film at all? I don't think so, no. There were parts where I thought, huh, but, but it, if anything, it took me out of the movie uh-huh. again and again, because I kept thinking about that. I kept uh-huh. thinking about somebody deciding... The ship is going up and down. So why do we go forward and backward? Or, you know, something is turning. Why are we turning with it? And then the next time something turns, we don't. There were rumbles and there were jolts. Uh Uh-huh. And honestly, every time it was a jolt, I had to force myself not to look behind and see (laughs) who just kicked me. Who who did that? Damn it. Who is that sitting behind us? Uh, To me, it was not a fun experience. It Uh was irritating. And at the very, very end of the movie, they have one of those little codas like you get in a Marvel Studios film or or a movie that respects the people whose names are going through the credits. And there was a scare and you went, ah! right? Yeah. But you would not have done that had the seat not went. Ah! Yeah, it was funny. I was saying that as as we were sitting there, I said, wow, I think I jumped a whole lot more because the seat like shook me it's like you watch a scary movie with someone who's seen it a hundred times or whatever so they know when to reach over and like grab you or something they know when the scary part is so you're sitting there and you're getting tense and then somebody next to you goes ah and then you jump and then the real scare comes and you jump again it was kind of like that yeah the chair jumped as the uh scary part happened and i was just like ah that's funny i I don't think i would have jumped nearly Probably not at all, but nearly as much at the very least that I did because the chair did that to me. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I disliked it as much as you did. Well, Um, one more interruption. Oh, okay. I was really afraid beyond the the quality of the movie that I was going to get motion sick. Uh Uh-huh. Because the, what do you call it? The demo thing. Yeah. Just moved like at random. It was, right. it was just trying to show you the various ways that the chair could move. And it wasn't really in sync with what you were seeing on the screen. I mean, it sort of was, but I was just like, oh, no, you know, this thing's going to be all <laughs> over the place. Because I have gotten sick on Star Tours before. Now, oh. Star Tours goes all over crazy up down uh-huh. to convince you that you're actually in a, a Pee Wee Herman piloted starship. But it's... Wasn't uh, that the flight of the Navigator that was flown by Pee Wee Herman or did he, they both he was the robot there too but back uh before I interrupted you I said I was afraid I was going to get motion sick 
and I wasn't. The, the, the range of motion wasn't that great. Plus, there was a little bar, and I don't think you touched yours. I didn't touch mine either. But you could turn down how intense the oh, rocking really? was going to be and add four different levels. I had no idea. The bottom level being probably a rumble here Barely, and there. yeah. But uh, both of ours was on max the whole time, and I was never tempted to turn it down. Uh-huh. It wasn't that rough. Yeah, I was just the same as you. I, when I sat in that freaking preview seat, it was all over the place. And I just remember thinking, God, who would want to see a movie like this? This would be the most annoying thing to do watching a movie. This has got to be the worst ever. Uh, I was afraid that I wouldn't even be able to follow the plot of the movie because I would spend so much time going, oh my goodness, I'm I'm being rocked all over the place. Please stop. The first movie they've got in D-Box is Blair Witch Project. And you're like, (laughs) oh no. And yeah, I was expecting it to be like that. And it wasn't anywhere close to that. It wasn't like what the preview thing was. The preview thing did a lot of big movements. And the movie itself did hardly any big movements. There was a lot of rumbles and, you know, your chair would rock here and there and stuff like that. But it was never a huge movement where you actually feel your head snap around or something like that. But it was in the preview thing. And so I was expecting it to be awful. And the start of the movie, not a lot is going on. You know, it's people. Chicken burrito. Right, chicken burrito, you know, a guy sitting at a bar. They didn't do much, you know. You, you're sitting there in the chair. And it starts off with their little pre-title thing where they send off their signal and you get to ride the signal all the way to Planet X or whatever. What do they call it? Planet? I, I want to say Planet G? G. Yeah, something like that because it's the Goldilocks planet. That was the first bit. You ride the signal out and then you're like, oh, that was kind of interesting. It was like I was on the Millennium Falcon hitting hyperspace or something. But it wasn't terrible. It wasn't really annoying. It wasn't something that was necessary for sure. I think it could be something that you could get used to. If you went and saw every movie in that, maybe you could even get to the point where you'd be like, eh, movies aren't as cool without D-Box. But I don't think it'll catch on. Like I was saying to you, it's not going to be a job that you can be long-term as the guy that programs the D-Box, I don't think. Because it's so damned expensive. We went to that film and it cost, I don't remember what, but it was close to like $17 or $18 a ticket. And it wasn't even a 3D showing. That's the funny thing is there were all these 3D glasses waiting on a table. You said, well, they didn't tell us to take these. Should we just grab them? So both of us grabbed 3D glasses. uh, And yeah, it wasn't in 3D. Yeah, I just assumed it would be because... It just seems like that's the next level. You know, you start with regular movies, then you have 3D movies, then you have 4D or whatever you want to call a D-Box thing. You've got an extra dimension of feeling into this movie of you're rocking around with the stuff. But it wasn't. I don't know why they would have a D-Box theater that isn't 3D. It doesn't make (laughs) any sense to me. It was 3D. Yeah, there you go. It was a 2D screen plus a third D of rocking around. The D-Box didn't bother me that much. Uh, There were a few times where I was just like, it's probably more than it needed to be. And yeah, it kind of distracts you. It takes you out of the film. It wasn't an engrossing film to begin with, so it's not like it was a problem to be taken out of the film. But there were times there was too much. There was other times where I was really impressed by the sensations that you got from the seat. Like I remember there was a time, and I want to say they were dropping the anchor or maybe they cut the anchor. I can't remember what it was, but you can feel the chain go thunk, 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 thunk under your seat as they're rolling it out. And I was just like, wow, that is pretty impressive that you can get that kind of a distinct sensation from it. And there was a couple other times that were kind of like that. I want to say maybe a helicopter was flying and so you could feel the whoop, 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 whoop in your chair or something like that. Other times it was just shake you around, crash you about kind of feelings where it could be anything sometimes you you were moving like you were saying yeah you were moving forward but the ship is going up and down is that even the right direction that i should be moving or is there a short between the computer and the seat now and i'm just going wherever i want to see the death star trench sequence for d box you know you start with the x-wings taking off from yavin and you end with the explosion of the death star so it's probably a 12 minute Thing. I'm on the leader. But I, I want it 
you know, specifically set for that. And I wouldn't even mind if they re-edited the the film so it's you know much longer takes and that you know just you know CG and that so that you don't <laughs> jump from ship to ship to ship causing you to be sick. Um, something that I talked to you about on the phone, but I never talked about here on that gets my goat was at Comic Con for the Star Wars trilogy Blu-ray release. Fox had a like a demo reel kind of thing where you would go in and you were in the Yavin base and you were at one of those vantage points like Leia and 3PO are at where they're watching what's going on on the battle and they had re-edited the the Death Star Trench sequence so that it would be Michael Bay-esque? Well, that's exactly what it was, but it was so that it would be compact enough to do it, you know, 50 times in a day and edited so that, yeah, any extraneous stuff like Luke hearing Obi-Wan and waiting and, you know, or, or, or feeling bad when Biggs dies and stuff, all that worthless waste of time <laughs> is gone. And it was just explosions and, you know, ships crashing or, or shooting one another and all that. It had been re-edited in that way. And, oh, I responded so negatively to it. I mean, every moment of emotion or stress or, you know, of, of any everything that worked Story. about that was gone. But, I mean, it had been professionally re-edited. So, you know, along with the John Williams score and all that, so that you wouldn't notice that this was a truncated version. So it's out there. Somebody has, has digitized all these scenes and separated them and all that. If they wanted to do it in a D-box environment, don't Michael Bay it. Uh -huh. Do the opposite where it's, you know, far less jumping around and stuff like that. But But you know what? I was so offended by the re-edit anyway at Comic-Con that maybe you just upset people that are like, well, they didn't shoot R2. Why wouldn't you shoot R2? You know, whatever it is. That's uh, one thing that I kind of worried. And we talked about that. I don't know if we did on the episode or what, but we talked about watching Battleship on D-Box. We assumed because Battleship desperately tried to make itself out to be Transformers Part 4. We assumed that this was going to be just like a Transformers movie where it's cut, 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 cut. You can't tell what's going on, who's fighting who, or at any moment, anything. It's just flashing images like a music video. And I was just thinking, what is that going to be like on a D-Box? You'll have one second of a shot of this happening and then it jerks you for this, then one second and it jerks you for that. I don't think you could do that. Right. That person whose job it is to program it would throw his hands up in the air <laughs> and say, okay, only when Optimus Prime and Bumblebee are on the screen will the D-Box respond. <laughs> I mean, what else could you do? Just make it rumble the entire time. It just shakes underneath you. And you feel like you've been sitting in one of those chairs at the store in the mall where they do the massage <laughs> things. <laughs> or you, know, you go to a motel and you put quarters in. Right, the Yeah. The funny thing was, though, it wasn't... I didn't notice it being edited like that. Did you get that from the film? I thought it was edited in a fairly standard... I mean, there was a few spots where there were some fight scenes and you couldn't... Not like a martial arts movie or something where they got a wide shot and the guys just go at it. Well, it's it's like when you've got two stuntmen fighting, but you don't want the audience to realize they're not your guys. So like... <laughs> right. There was a little of that in some fight scenes, but for the most part... It was way better than The Hunger Games, for example, which was edited like crap and shot like crap. Okay, I, you and I are in agreement on that. And ILM did the special effects for Battleship. I mean, did the, what would you call? They were the lead? The lead effects group. And, and nowadays, you've got somebody that does the computer readouts. You do somebody that does the color correction. You, you know what I mean? All this stuff is farmed out to different companies. But, and that's probably wise. Because somebody is going to do the best they can with the three minutes they've been given. Instead of if it's like a Star Wars prequel or whatever, where the same effects company has to do it all. Um, you know, that must probably not be a good example because the Star Wars yeah, prequels they, had really good special they effects. They looked pretty good. But what I was going to say is, is Peter Berg, this guy that directed the film, it's almost as though he wanted to show off these special effects. Almost as though he realized that this thing cost $200 million in effects alone. And we wouldn't want to waste that. I know that's just revolutionary thinking. <laughs> it's, it's almost crazy to imagine that you would want to do that. 
and I'm only half joking because this movie so wanted to be confused for Transformers. It really did. In all of its marketing and its posters and, and all that, that you wouldn't ape the style of the Transformers movies makes me want to put my arm around this director and say, right. you know, I didn't love this movie that you made, but I will see what you make next. You're not a fucking asshole. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep the language to a minimum and, and the outrage to a minimum. But part of me wonders if the audience wants me to just be insanely <laughs> angry and angry at you and saying this is the last episode ever and F you two and a half guys that donated. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. I had a good attitude for me, a good attitude going into this thing because it was like a, a girl that you're interested in wants to go see a movie that you don't want to see. But because you're interested in the girl, you go anyway. And and the movie is secondary kind of thing. And, and I know that that came out gayer than it was meant to be. <laughs> but but it's just like, you know, somebody was paying my way. I didn't know you were interested in me, Rish. And I was going to be gracious about it. But like you said, people probably don't want me to be gracious. <laughs> well, they wanted we can, to piss me off. We can get to that. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's what I got from it, the special effects. And, and another thing. The advantage of this screenplay over Transformers, you know, I'm not even going to give Transformers that benefit of the doubt. I'll bet that screenplay said Megatron hits Optimus Prime, Bumblebee hits Starscream, Jazz hits Soundwave or whatever, and Michael Bay made the decision, Big Gray Robot hits other identical Big Gray Robot. <laughs> but this one had the advantage of alien ships that looked like Michael Bay Transformers, and then traditional... American warships, battleships, right? battleships and destroyers and all that stuff. And it was always obvious which is alien, which is us. Yeah. And so that's an advantage that you don't have with the Michael Bay Transformers movies. Yeah. It's funny you were saying that, uh, that this movie so wanted to be Transformers. And I had already said that too. I went to my son's baseball game the next day and there were some people sitting next to me that were talking about going to see Battleship. They said uh, one of them says, "Yeah, it's it's based on uh, the game Battleship." And then one of the kids goes, "Yeah, it's based on the game Battleship, but it's also based on the Transformers." <laughs> I thought that that's was so funny. A, that's not an accident. <laughs> yeah, they put that on the trailer from Hasbro, the toy company that brought you Transformers. I mean, seriously. The toy company that brought you the toys, the Transformers, is trying to latch on to the success of the movie of the really ridiculous. And, yeah, those spaceship, whatever you want to call them, ships that the aliens had were obviously supposed to look like Transformer ships. And that sucked, I'll have to say. The special effects were well done and they looked nice and everything, but the design of them just sucked. I don't know. Well, is that the fault of the makers of Battleship or... Is it ILM's fault or is it Hasbro's fault? Whose fault is that? Because do you remember like when ILM was making the Star Wars prequels, they'd use like everything that the other studios were paying them to do and they'd build off of that. Like uh -huh. the mummy, Universal paid them a bunch of money to make the mummy or whatever and they took advantage of that and made, geez, what did they make off of it? Gungans? <laughs> and, you know, things like that, where they just they used the same programs Bodies that they had and created and all that and built on that so that it would be so much cheaper. And, you know, that's that's one thing I, I complain about the Star Wars prequels a lot, but their budgets were so low compared to everything else that we see. Yeah. And, I mean, they that was responsible filmmaking. They're the, all, the, all, the only better example is the friggin Lord of the Rings trilogy. Where each one of those cost $110 million. Yeah. But those are $500 million movies just looking at them. I mean, even today, maybe you'll get a weak special effect here or there. But there's three and a half hours of it. Right. And with the Star Wars things, it was all up on the screen. Tons of CG. Maybe too much CG. But yes. you can't say, oh, geez, they spent half a billion dollars on this. Like you can with a lot of the movies that are coming out. Right. Including... Battleship, which I told you was Universal's biggest budget movie of all time. I mean, they made that three and a half hour King Kong. Yeah, and that was all CG too. I, I would assume the director, I don't know who gets the final call on that kind of stuff, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it was Hasbro. Maybe there's some suits that look at the uh, ships and they go, you know, that one sucks. It's probably not like it was for the Star Wars prequels. You always see the footage where... 
George Lucas comes along and he's got his stupid little stamp and he's like, this one's good. And uh, this one. And he does that. That's a criticism, but it's also praiseworthy in a way. It's his vision. Yeah, it is. It's one guy and it wasn't a huge board of faceless dudes. Right. And and that's my guess with Hasbro, but we haven't seen tons of battleship action figures and stuff all over. Why? Why would they not... I don't know. Why would they not develop that? If they developed the movie themselves, they could have had these suckers done early and cheaply. And you would I, think that there would maybe it just doesn't have the uh, expected reach. It didn't make money like they wanted it to. We were talking weeks ago that like Battleship had made, oh, it's made 200 million overseas. But that's kind of where it stopped. Yeah, that's what Avengers made today. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it's just... Because of that, it doesn't have the appeal to kids like they thought it was going to. Okay, but it, again, how do you justify? What is the budget? Two twenty, two forty. Let me click. Okay, according to Box Office Mojo, the production budget was two oh nine. But you can never trust these things. I don't know if that's true or not. But it was way expensive for what it was. It was the tentpole Universal film. Of all time, if it's their most expensive movie, but of the summer, definitely. How do you justify putting all of your eggs in one basket like that for something as tenuous as Battleship? E9, miss. G1, hit. Yeah. And maybe they wanted to make a $70 million movie and some genius said, if we make it look like Transformers and triple the budget... You know, we could have a giant hit money. like Transformers. I, there's there's somebody who no longer has a job <laughs> yeah. whose decision that was. Uh, and, and I know on that first Avengers episode, all I talked about was this is the money and this and that. But it's it's significant. The the pundits were saying that it had to make 50 million its opening weekend just to break even. And it made 25.5. That's half of what it had to make to break even. That's a bomb, man. That's a bigger bomb than John Carter. And, I mean, you you hear about the people that lost their jobs over John Carter. I don't know, because these are all people, I guess. If we were in a room with them, maybe I would realize that they breathe and eat and weep. But uh, All weekend long. I think of these (laughs) faceless bigwigs that have 24-hour car service. They can't drive from Beverly Hills to Universal City on their own and... You know, they make $7 million just for having an office and things like that. It's hard to feel sorry for people like that. Right. But yeah, they weep too. And I'm sure they were doing a lot of weeping. As far as that goes, you know, the whole budget thing, hopefully some people learn some lessons this year. We've already had John Carter. Now we've got Battleship. How many more movies that are over $200 million budgets that... Don't even come close to making that in the theater. Are we going to have to see before they start going, whoa, maybe we better deflate the budgets a little. Is Avengers going to ruin that for everybody? And they're all going to think, hey, Avengers did it, so we can too with Clue. The the fact that we had such a huge hit in Avengers just a couple weeks ago deflates that argument. Any one of these guys can say, Avengers. Where they should be looking at Hunger Games just a couple months ago, which had a reasonable budget. It had a lot of special effects, but it was not an expensive movie. I I think that movie was made, whether I have problems with the way it was made or not, it was made responsibly. And that's the thing with responsibility. You know, somebody's got to have their name on that and say, if it's a hit, I would like some recognition. But if it's a failure, I understand I'm the guy that screwed up. And in Hollywood, nobody's like, I mean, they're they're all just scrambling. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. I created Star Wars. I created life on Earth. And (laughs) everybody wants that. Every time there's a hit movie, there's a bunch of lawsuits and probably 20 lawsuits we never hear about for every one that we do of people saying, that was me. I did that. That was me. I guess some people are legitimately screwed over. But uh, but there's way more that just money grubbing bastards that are out to steal a piece of the pie that they never helped make they're like the red hen that made the loaf of bread and they were the ones that are like not i said the rabbit or whoever the heck it is that wouldn't help her <laughs> said the upper level executive <laughs> that's right but who will help and then he me goes who eat? will help me eat the bread oh me 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 because i'm sorry one more interruption there is some guy 
who had the chance to acquire Marvel Studios or to distribute the movies of Marvel Studios at Disney in 2007 or 2008 and said no. And he got a giant paycheck for Avengers. You know what I mean? This is a guy who said no. Not only did he not make the movie, he prevented the movie from being made at that studio and he got a check. And that's what I'm talking about. That is so unright, man, that kind of crap. And it happens all the time. Disney didn't make Avengers. Disney distributed Avengers. Paramount had a hell of a lot more to do for making Avengers because they said, yes, we will distribute your Marvel Studios films. And then after they had had four hits, Disney's like, well, we're going to take over now. We always believed in these guys. I don't know. It's fine because Paramount's doing all right. (laughs) And they made Transformers Oh, so they're going to burn in hell with the rest will, of them. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to hear you talk nice about them anymore. It's so weird when, when we see this. You know, <laughs> I did this. I, I always believed in Joss Whedon. I renewed Buffy for an 11th season. And you're like, no, you didn't. No one renewed Buffy for an 11th season. I gave him a back rub and gave him a three-picture deal all for Serenity sequels. Oh, no, you didn't. But I guess that's how everything is in corporate, not even corporate America, corporate Earth. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a tangent, but it was four people who wanted me to be angry. There you go. Before we go too much further into the tangent, let's let's go back to the film itself. Now, we talked a little bit about what we expected a battleship movie should be. It should be a battleship versus a battleship. Well, if you're using the Milton Bradley game, I'm sorry, Hasbro what? Hasbro acquired Milton Bradley. Did they make the game? No. <laughs> if you use the game as a springboard... That's what you would like is two opposing forces that have the same technology kind of thing trying to wipe each other out. And there was a tip of the hat to that in the movie. And that's probably one of the best sequences in the movie. It was uh, actually very creatively done the way they made some way to say you can finally say it's loosely based on if you want to read my blog and i don't ask people to do that but i came up with my own version and and we didn't talk about it on the air but i just thought you know do it like wrath of khan where there's somebody that steals an american ship and he's going up against like a co-worker or his mentor or something like that and you know you have to use your wits to to defeat this guy And, and and you know it's a cat and mouse game and that and when i said that to somebody he said yeah You mean like Hunt for Red October? (laughs) Okay, but Hunt for Red October is more Battleship than Transformers. It's way more Battleship than Battleship is. (laughs) But anyhow, yes. That's the kind of movie that you would expect. And I've I've seen reviews from people where they're just like, I don't know what they were thinking with this Battleship. I mean, I would like to see a Battleship movie that was about Battleships, but this isn't about Battleships. And I was just bored because the whole time they were doing this stupid, crazy stuff. I don't know. It seemed a lot like... Independence Day sure. meets Transformers or something. The, the Independence Day was in there really heavily, I thought. The, the aliens arrived. They never, for a second, nobody's trying to like, hey, maybe we should make contact with these aliens. No, and they right away are hostile. They just show up to take over the world, I guess, is their plan. We don't really know. They just show up. And there was something really lame about the aliens to me. I don't know if you thought that, but... They basically look like humans. They have two legs, two arms. Uh, their faces were almost exactly the same. They had friggin' goatees even, although they're made out of like horny type It was like a material. walrus or one of those seals yeah. that has almost a beard like... Like rough whiskers, really thick stuff. But they had freaking goatees. They had regular eyes. They had nose, mouth, face, everything was exactly the same. I mean, at least in Independence Day, their aliens were alien-looking. They had, like, tentacles and big heads and weird crap going on. You could have, I guess, said, hey, it's humans versus humans. They look exactly the same. I don't know why they made that decision. I mean, obviously, most of the times when a guy is fighting an alien, it's a guy fighting a guy. Right. right. And there were times when you could like see the eyes of the aliens through the visor. And I'd be like, is that is that a dude in that? Is that, yeah. you know what I mean? The, the, the outfits that they would wear, the armor stuff, it just looked like an anime stuff. It was like the, the stuff. Like that Macross the guys that, or something like that. Yeah. The guys that rode Robotech. the bikes on Robotech or something wore. It didn't look alien at all. 
It just looked like, oh yeah, that's a fancy outfit. They must have been at an anime uh, convention or something. So the the effects budget, the giant effects budget, didn't really go into that. I mean, well, obviously, whenever they take off the helmet, or yeah. Whatever. Why couldn't that just have been prosthetics? Why couldn't that have been? They don't do prosthetics anymore. Those guys are all the dudes that you see on TV. They're sitting on the street holding the signs, have saying, "Movie special effects man down on his luck. Please give." But have you, you've seen Predator, right? You remember when that thing, when it takes off the helmet and you've got this unbelievably alien yet humanoid creature and it would move and ch- and that, all of it, of course, done practically. You, I, I don't think there was anything about those aliens that we saw that couldn't have been done practically. And yeah. listen, they were well done. They didn't look like bad CG creations, but that's probably because they were expensive. Yeah. It's, and it's kind of a shame that they weren't just, okay, this is what we want to look like. Can we do that in rubber? Yeah, they could have easily. Wasn't even difficult. So maybe there's more irresponsible filmmaking. Yeah, that's one Somebody of the reasons that why said, it's 209 million instead of 180. Okay, the ships, nobody's going to do that practically anymore. I, uh-huh. I mean, I'm sorry, the alien ships. The, right. the human ships... Gosh, if 75% of those shots weren't actual ships or miniatures, then somebody needs to be put to death. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could see. It's, I know was... it's not Texas, but not just fired. They need to be killed. Yeah, maybe that's how we can get responsible filmmaking restored. <laughs> have a death sentence for anybody who does something stupid. We, we have these ships, and I know that this film was made with the cooperation of the U.S. military. Not to the point of like act of valor or something like that, but at least to the same level that the Transformers movies are. Not to the level where they actually blew up the battleships that did blow up. (laughs) But they did have actual destroyers and battleships that they were using all over the place. But I did see uh, there was some shots that I remember seeing where there were wide shots of ships doing this and doing that where you could look at it and go, okay, that is not real. Okay. You could tell that like the water that's sure. splashing up on the sides and stuff was not there. It was probably a short shot and, you know, they only had so much to do. But And obviously there was some, there was a few things that were, you know, when the battleship drops its anchor and suddenly starts surfing or whatever the crap it did there at that one point, obviously that's not a real shot. Uh, if Titanic were made today, I bet you could make the same exact movie for three quarters of the price. Now for half the price. Just using CG. You wouldn't have to build a three-quarters scale Titanic out in Mexico and stuff. But would it look as good? You didn't go see the re-release of Titanic, right? And I I didn't either. No. I wonder if every time it becomes a CG ship... We're like, ooh, 1997. Yeah, I remember. I remember. There's that one flyover that, where the people yeah. become super animated. Yeah, I remember thinking that at that one shot. Boy, that does not look like a real person. He just doesn't move right. It's Roger Rabbit up there, and all of a sudden we're back to real people. But with all these ships, do you not think that every shot with the American ships could have been done with miniatures? You could blow up a miniature. You could sink a miniature. You could whap around a miniature with the anchor, right? I would think so. I'm I'm obviously not an expert. I did have one special effects class. You did? Where we blew up some things with some gasoline. That was fun. Oh, that's an episode in <laughs> itself. That's really interesting. But uh, we never did anything that intense. And it was all practical special effects. So none well, of it of was course. computer animated stuff. So, But like there's $80 million right there. Here you go. We did it practically. Yeah. And I, you know what? I know that I'm old. Uh, every <laughs> once in a while, I'll see a little white hair in my beard. But that stuff never looks faker than it does the day you shoot it. You can fool the eye in a way that you, that's much more difficult with computer animation when it's actually there. I mean, you can shoot it in a big tank and the sun is actually in the sky the way the sun would be. <laughs> on a real ship out to sea and things like that. And it's harder because you don't have 400 guys whose whole job is to make the ship look like it's in the water and all that stuff. But it's so much cheaper. Yeah. And again, I'll keep using this word. It's more responsible if you've got something risky like a feature length film based on a game from the a, 1950s not even a video game this is a board game we're talking about 
Okay, well, I, I'm sorry. I keep talking about the budget. Can you turn off <laughs> Box Office Mojo and I won't bring it up again? Sure, I, I want to... Because uh, you know what? Avengers had practically the same budget. Yeah. And I don't think we talked about how irresponsible it was that they didn't paint a guy green. So what did you think of the film itself? The idea we know and we've said before seems just ridiculous. It's why are we having a battleship game of people versus aliens? Did it suck as much as you thought it would? Okay, and here's the part where people aren't going to get their money's worth. (laughs) Because heck no. Yeah. It was a competently made film. And the biggest problem I had with it was that it was called Battleship. If this had been generic alien invasion movie at sea coming this summer, I think every reviewer, every person that saw it would have automatically tacked on another star in the review. Well, if it was called that, though, generic alien invasion movie at sea, they would have had to come up with something a little more snappy, I'm afraid. Okay. I'm sure I could come up with something. If they couldn't at least remove the word generic out of the title, then they wouldn't get that extra star. Part of the problem is we had an alien invasion movie two weeks ago. Yeah. That's what I was. I was kind of saying that to you. Can we even have a battleship movie? I mean, way back when we talked about Hunt from Red October already. If we did battleship the way you mentioned, oh, we're stealing Hunt from Red October. Hunt for Red October was a big movie. It was a big deal when it came out, and it made a lot of money for the time. Could something like that still be a big movie and make a lot of money, or are those days past? Does it have to be Alien Invasion Transformers meets Battleship slash World Cup scene, which was really stupid, tacked on? It depends on the movie. A movie like Taken is an old-fashioned a bunch of bad guys take his daughter, he gets her back. Yeah, it could have been Charles Bronson in exactly, that movie. Exactly. Right? It depends on how well the movie is made. Now, Hunt for Red October was made by John McTiernan, the guy who did Predator and Die Hard. I mean, an unbelievably good action film director. I guess I was a little too young for Hunt for Red October when it came out because it bored the crap <laughs> out of me. But Crimson Tide came out like a decade later. And that was successful. Right. I just wonder, because like these days, the big move, I guess you've got something like Bridesmaids, which was huge, and Hangover, which was huge, and they're not alien invasion movies at all. And they made hundreds of millions of dollars, which comedies don't make. So maybe it's possible. The Bourne movies and James Bond okay, movies. Okay, th- those Bourne movies, that's a perfect example, except for the problems I have with the way those movies right. are made. They are old-fashioned spy action flicks. It could be Jean-Claude Van Damme. It could be Steve McQueen. It could, you know, just depending on the era that it was made, I mean, it could have been Connery. Uh And we continue to have James Bond movies every few years. And as far as I know, he's never fought aliens. It's coming. But just like Indiana Jones, it's coming. Men in Black. Oh, God, that's right. (laughs) Men in Black 3 comes out this week. And there's another, I mean, right? The, aren't the bad guys aliens uh, again? Yeah. Uh, we got to save the earth from uh, aliens. There's a lot. Is it like there's the E.T. thing where they had to turn, they had to make everything uh, kids safe. They took the guns out of the guy's hands and made them into flashlights and stuff. And you, you were saying that they did that with the Star Wars prequels. The reasons why we're fighting against a droidica army and all that crap is so you can just kill and shoot and blow things up and do all that stuff without there being any death toll. So you never get a PG-13 or whatever. You're just killing aliens and you're killing robots. And so it doesn't matter. You can kill all you want. And clones. Clones Clones are not people. people. And another change, a change that nobody ever talks about that Lucas made in those original Star Wars films, especially the first one, is he removed shots of... Guys getting killed by blaster fire. Uh, The guys, you know, oh, look out, he's loose. I'll get him in the Death Star and stuff like that. Nobody ever talks about that. But I've seen two image comparisons where you see the 77 version versus the 1997 version. You're like, wow, that's subtle, but that's gone. We don't want to upset people who think that this evil empire that just killed billions of people deserve to be shot. But, you know, same thing with a green alien that's about to blow your head off. It's not okay to shoot him first. I don't know. That's a whole episode <laughs> yeah, on we'll, itself we will not get... that's, that's not right. But that's part of, I guess, the era that we live in 
if the bad guys are aliens, then you can do whatever you want. But if they're anything else, then you've got special interest groups that you've got people of other nationalities yeah, that are going to be sensitive about it. That is the problem, I guess. Maybe it's that's what uh, the rise of the international markets has to do with filmmaking, is now you can't just say, well, they're just Soviets, so you can shoot a Soviet, <laughs> that's okay. You know, those kind of days are gone. Well, it's a shame then that they didn't take my script and just cast Channing Tatum as the bad guy because he's American and it's okay to shoot Americans. That is true, sadly. I'm um, sorry, I, we were talking about the movie. Yeah, I, going back to the movie, I have to agree with you. It really wasn't as awful as I expected. I expected it to just be utter crap. It was going to be like an episode one or a Transformers where the acting is terrible the script it doesn't make any sense you're just like what the hell i don't even know what's going on here well there were signs early on that it was going to be that the just stuff you know where they were setting up taylor kitsch's character as being such a bad boy and all that for no reason just so that he can redeem himself later or, or whatever yeah that was definitely overdone and that's one i think weakness that the movie had taylor kitsch just doesn't work as a big leading man for me especially in a movie like this where he's supposed to wind up being the captain on the battleship and well, stuff all he's not... we ever saw was him being a screw up right a, a, a loser a failure a guy who took nothing seriously and then the you know what hits the fan and he has to step up and be this great leader but i didn't buy there was no hint that he would be a great leader because we'd only seen him as a spoiled child right it didn't really work and the, like, the when, other thing was like he comes in okay uh who's next in command <laughs> oh this guy but he's dead too oh well then who's next in command well, oh, you are the sir. next senior <laughs> how the hell he just joined the friggin navy at the start of the movie which couldn't have been more than three or four years earlier, how was he that senior already? I didn't get that either. They, they may have established it early on, but if so, they glossed over it because they didn't tell us how long he'd been dating Brooklyn Deckler and he, how long he'd been in the Navy and all that stuff. So when he is the ranking officer or whatever, I just thought, oh, geez. Is the is Navy that easy to become the guy in charge of? And I guess they blew up everybody but the three people that were on that little <laughs> boat. And hence, it's like he's the only commissioned officer. Yeah, how and so he gets to. But again, you can't be this long haired bad boy and rise even to the yeah. rank that he was at. Just like who that, has you no snap respect your for authority and stuff like that. You have to do all these menial tasks and, and right. say yes, sir, and eat crap a lot. Yeah. If unless... you want to be an officer, people go to like the freaking Naval Academy and crap like that for years and stuff to become these kind of people. How they're just planning happens. for it in, in high school and junior high. Right. How it be. just happens in a week for this dude is like, hey, and oh, by the way, I got you a chicken burrito. It was pretty <laughs> ridiculous, that whole turn of events. It would have been much better had he... It, it was too much of a swing. That was one of the was. big problems. That pre-credit thing should have been skipped. And they should have had it a different way. He should have started as... Maybe he was in screw-up in the Navy already. But he had to have at least been through all that stuff before. Give him a reason why he suddenly hates everything and is a screw-up or something. I don't know. Maybe they just wanted to... Let him have long hair since that is what he's known for or something, at least once in the film. Well, we see it a lot in like cop movies where it's like, oh, he was a good cop, but now he lives in the bottle. You know what I mean? Right. They're drunk all the time or they don't take anything seriously or they've screwed up and they can't get past this problem. And that works for cop movies because you establish that they used to be a good cop or they had the potential to be a great cop if they'd only put their mind to it and all that. And in this, I guess there was a couple of throwaway lines about that of you, if you applied yourself. And Neeson has a line early on where it bothers me that you know that quote that I just gave or whatever. So I guess they were trying to establish that he, he had the smart. smarts and all this stuff. It works great on paper to say there's a kid and he does all this stuff, but he's lazy or but he's a rebel or but, you know, he doesn't toe the line. And then circumstances are going to occur to make him take responsibility and be serious for the first time. But it didn't work in the movie, partly because you have to show us all of these things that he is a good leader. Right. That he, you know, and, and they didn't. The soccer scene 
Was that intended to show us that he's a great military thinker? I don't think so. I, I think it was an excuse to please the international market that really likes football and to show that he has a temper and to set up an enmity set, between him yeah, and the him Japanese, and the Japanese guy. I think that was the main thing was just him and the Japanese guy. They don't like each other. And here's how you know, because there was this World Cup thing and they already kind of didn't like each other. And then he kicked him in the face. And what was the deal with that? It was one of those things, you know, we, we haven't even touched on Rihanna yet, but we have the U.S. team and the Japanese team, right? And you've got the Japanese team wearing the same color uniform. And you have the U.S. teams all wearing the same color uniform. And then there's Rihanna, who is out there. I guess she's part of the team. I don't know. And when they play soccer, they play women's soccer or they play men's soccer. They don't play co-ed soccer anywhere. And she's out there just with like a t-shirt that's a different color blue than the rest of the guys. And it's like got short sleeves pulled up high. It's totally different. Like, what is she even doing out there? Well, see, I assumed she was from another ship because there were international ships competing. And I figured, okay, whatever Rihanna is, she's from Belize or something like that. <laughs> That's where her ship is from. But no, she's American. She's on the American team. And yet she's got a totally different outfit on than the rest of the team. Why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense at all. It's like somebody who's never seen a sporting event in their life decides to do this. Oh, let's throw in a sporting thing here. And eh, Well, she's, she's different, so let's put her in a special outfit. See, it would have been more helpful if she had been identically dressed to our guys. So we know, okay, right. even though she's got dark skin and light eyes, which no one I know has, she is one of us. No, I mean, I'm sorry if that sounds <laughs> racist. She's exotic looking is what I'm saying. You know what I mean? She uh -huh. doesn't look like the girl next door. Uh -huh. She's not the girl you went to junior high with. She is an international supermodel R&B singer, okay? <laughs> right. Who has a very unique look. Hopefully I covered my tracks on that. I just, I'm so paranoid that people, because you can say Taylor Hitch is a moron because he's white. Not. Taylor Kitsch, how many times have I said Hitch? Twice, I think is all. I, you know what I mean? You can't, you can say Liam Neeson's American accent was obscene <laughs> because he's a white guy and there's no worries and all that. And, and, and it's a shame. Gosh, what was up with his voice? I just, I don't get it. He's a talented actor. <laughs> Everything that he said, I was just like. Is he mocking me? <laughs> Anyhow, I guess we can talk about Rihanna if you want to. Yeah, I know that you really dislike Rihanna. Before we ever started, you're not a fan of her music or anything that slightly resembles the music that she does. <laughs> um, and okay. I don't know if you dislike her for other reasons than just that you don't like her music. Well, I gave you that example of Madonna showing up in Die Another Day. <laughs> right. And I remember people in the audience. Now, granted, I might have seen it with a more cynical audience or whatever. But people booed when she showed up and started doing her British accent and wanted to show Bond she could beat him with a sword or whatever because it was so indulgent. It felt so like contractually obligated because she <laughs> did the theme song. Plus, it was like Madonna. F it, man. And that's how I felt about Rihanna. Every time I saw her in the previews or the trailers or the posters or whatever, I was like, oh, somebody somewhere is checking boxes by casting Rihanna and by making sure that a certain segment of the population sees that she's in it so that they'll go to it because they wouldn't otherwise go to it. And, and stuff like that is so crass. Like when you see a trailer... And they hint that there might be a girl taking her shirt off or whatever, just so certain guys will go to it. But when you go see the movie, that scene's not in the movie. That's crass, underhanded, devious crap to trick people into going to the movie. And I guess I just equated putting a pop star in a movie with a dishonest promise of nudity. But it's the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> Yeah, Rihanna did not take her shirt off, unfortunately, in the film, although... She's, is she an actress? Is, I think, is Rihanna an actress? I think that was her very first film, so I don't know that you could say she's... I guess she did it once, so I guess now she's an actress. Well, certainly, But yeah. she never was before. That's her very first time on screen. Okay, and, and so there's my complaint. Why is she in this movie? She's not an actress, and... She wasn't as crappy as I thought she would be. She didn't stink up the screen like some people we've seen in movies. Sometimes people are so hopelessly miscast because they're trying to get butts in the seat in that same <laughs> it way. It wasn't it was like, like seeing Coolio in the Batman movie. 
<laughs> I'm trying. At to... least they kept Coolio to a minimum in that movie. <laughs> like in Avengers, when Lady Gaga steps out and she's Wasp. It, why is she? Oh, it's because you're trying to check boxes. And I don't approve. But yeah, Rihanna, I don't think was bad. She did a fairly decent job. A lot of her line delivery seemed a little stiff here and there. Uh, let me interrupt, though. Mahalo, motherfucker. <laughs> no, Mahalo, mother. Um, they did that like three times in the movie where they blew up instead of saying the word. I changed my nephew's diaper today and it was so gross. I mean, he had laid in it and taken a nap <laughs> and it was all rolling down his legs and it was under his places. Please tell us more. And it, it was preferable to Mahalo, motherfucker. Yeah. Oh, that- sorry, mother. Bo- mother boom. Kablam. It was a lame line, but I don't think she wrote it. You know? It was there so that her fans would be like, oh, yeah, it was one of those. It was, it was a throwback. It was, yeah, it was an uh, 80s action hero It was something from line. an, it was a dinosaur yeah. come up and you're just like, what is this dinosaur doing in this movie about mammoths? It looked like it could have come out of the trailer for Expendables, which relies on that kind of stuff. It's all about, hey, remember all these guys that you loved from those old movies in the 80s? Well, they're back. Even Arnold says, I'm back in the trailer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was one of those kind of lines that you would expect Arnold to say right before he blasts the uh, predator or something like that. And that stuff, I guess, has its place. I don't know. Imagine that you had been in your 30s in the 80s and you saw that stuff. That would you make know, one off some right? steam. Richter. Remember when I said I'd kill you last? There's nothing wrong with that line. That's not what I'm talking about. I lied. I do. I just love that line. I'm sorry it came to mind. The, That's the, my favorite Schwarzenegger line. The Iceman cometh. That's what I'm talking about. Stuff like that. Ooh, I really creamed that guy to cone a phrase. Okay, there you go. That's perfectly... <laughs> that one was already a parody of action movies. Yes, so, that, I guess so you can't really pick on that one. But apparently audiences revolted. Yeah, they that. hated and a parody of action revolted. movies. And audiences revolted with Batman and Robin as well. And yeah. I think that the, everything sort of changed. But like when Schwarzenegger in Terminator 3 says, Talk to the hand... It's possible that a five-year-old thought that that was freaking hilarious, but there shouldn't be a five-year-old in an R-rated action movie, okay? (laughs) We've gotten past that. It was a unique thing, I guess, in its time, and then it was pounded into the ground where there was nothing left of creativity or spark in there. And when Bruce Willis said, yippee ki mother, it was, oh, sorry, boom. (laughs) It was all over the ad campaigns and all that stuff. I mean, it was cool. But aping it 25 times, yeah. it stops being cool. It's, it's, just... it's like my uh, one complaint about Toy Story 2. It's like my biggest complaint about any uh, Pixar movie is when they went to the well of, No, Buzz, I am your father. And you're just like, oh. You know, that was cool like 20 years ago, but time has passed for doing that anymore. You've overdone that line can't do that stuff anymore and yeah that's that so mahalo mother say, boom was exactly the but same but they kind didn't of thing. say say hello to my little friend buzz oh Lester. yeah at least there was that yeah oh. we didn't get that in battleship either she didn't go and say say hello to my little friend alien that was the low point i i hated that there were a couple of moments like that that it's weird i love movies i love them that's my favorite pastime is movies And so maybe I've just had too much of that. And somebody that Battleship was made for has never seen anything like that. And he's like, (laughs) she almost said a bad word. And then there was an explosion. And you're like, go to your room. They did that like three times, man. What was the deal with that? It wasn't just that one time. They did it like two other times too. I mean, I can understand if it was a TV show. Why are they doing that in a feature film? I think it's time. And we've been going for a while and we probably need to wrap it up. So... We'll bring it to a close. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, oh. let, let me sum up by saying this. I'm sorry. I, I know I'm I keep jumping all over you. <laughs> but th- there was a sequence toward the very end of the film where all of our destroyers have been dest- destroyed. Oh, yes. All of our destroyers have been taken out. <laughs> <laughs> and they're forced to rely on this museum ship, which is the, the USS Missouri, which is a World War II era battleship. They need to get it out of mothballs. And they recruit all of these old guys who know how to get it going. 
who know how to load the torpedo bay or whatever, you know, the, the weapons and get the engine started and stuff. That's, it, it's all so antiquated that our young guys don't know how to run it. And that part of the film really worked for me. I the agree. Part, the part with the old guys and the part with the – there was a part where normally they would just have everything mechanized and be able to get something from one side of the ship to the other. But because they had none of that, they had to physically carry this round – this round of artillery, this artillery shell that weighed – Like a thousand pounds, they said. They had they to had physically to... carry it. And to me, that stuff worked. I liked yeah. that stuff. Now, granted, there were a couple of eye-rolling lines to get there, but that – where actually was a battleship, so it fit with the, the title plan. of the film and the part where they're playing battleship, E9, Miss. I think both of those scenes actually worked in the film, or both of those sequences were... Yeah, the- that was the, probably the one time when all those old guys that had fought in... Uh, they couldn't be guys that fought in World War II, but guys that had been from that era, they obviously had to be a little younger or else they wouldn't have been able to help because they'd be in wheelchairs and walkers and old folks homes but these guys who were actual navy that had used this ship when it could run you know those guys come out and that was probably the only moment where i actually felt some real emotion from that film where i thought cool you know it was one of those things you know they made the music swell when things blew up and when they saved the world etc but the one time that i actually felt the emotion with the music swelling was when all those guys came walking out to answer the call of duty. That was a really cool moment. I actually enjoyed that one. Yeah, there was lines that weren't great, but... uh, I'm sorry. I know you wanted just to sum up, but I felt like I had to say that. Yeah. Because that was genuinely good. And the, the man who made this film, he did Friday Night Lights. He did... He did Hancock and he did one other film that that's not coming to mind. I, he did a competent job. I feel like there were problems with the script. There were problems with what was expected of this movie. Right. But I've seen worse movies just this year. Underworld 4 was worse. Ghost Rider 2 was way worse. And, and then there's bad movies from the very beginning, from the conception of this movie. There are bad movies. And then there are bad movies because somebody did their jobs incompetently. Ghost Rider 2... Probably had a good script and all that, and it was ruined by the editing, by the way the movie was done. I've seen worse movies than Battleship. Yeah. And so I can't just say F you guys for donating (laughs) and F you D-Box and F you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not grateful that I saw it or anything like that, but I can tell people, eh, you know. Yeah, it wasn't like we've talked about before where you get up from the film and you're like, damn it, I want my two hours of my life back. That was the worst experience ever, which I expected it to be. I did too. It's one of those things where maybe part of it was that our expectations were so low that the fact that we went in there and it was not terrible is that we're like, wow, you know, that was actually fairly good. I was just going to sum up and say, yeah, the movie itself did have a ridiculous premise to begin with. And they did the best that they could with it, I thought. I don't know why it had to have such a premise and who forced that upon them. But yeah, the guy who directed it, he turned out a competent movie despite what he was fighting against. Unless he was the guy that did it all to begin with. And maybe it's all his fault. Who knows? But it wasn't terrible. And the D-Box experience itself also wasn't as terrible as I thought it was going to be. Just like the movie, I went in thinking it was going to be nauseating. And came out thinking there was actually interesting things that happened with it. And it's something that I could get used to. If it was just now you go to a movie and you can get that for free. I wonder, I was wondering this, did those D-Box chairs, do you think they do all those vibrations even if somebody doesn't pay for the seat? They have to, right? I assume they do. So you should just go to a showing that's not going to have that many people in it, buy a regular ticket, and then scoot down to the D-Box chairs. Okay, yeah, that's something that we (laughs) needed to establish early on. It was in a regular theater. Yeah. And there are only a few, probably 10% or less of the seats. two rows of seats and then the two seats that we sat on that were up in the front, that handicapped area where we always sit. I wondered about it when we first sat down because I thought, why would they do this? Is it that as it they make Natasha. as they make more money from this, they'll take out more seats and put in more D boxes, 
Or do they do this on purpose so that the people who are sitting in regular seats look and say, gosh, those D-Box guys seem to be having a lot more fun than we are. Maybe. It could be either way. Maybe it's just that they don't expect that many people are going to be willing to shell out $17 for a movie ticket to sit in a D-Box so they can only do so many seats. Because that's my problem. I I thought the D-Box was actually kind of cool. It wasn't terrible. It was something that I could even get used to, but I would never pay this kind of money for going to see a movie again and again. A one-time thing, yeah, I can see myself doing that, but next week, no way. I'm not going to pay that money. We got this money donated to us, and I still feel like it was too much. And and that's also part of the, I don't want to say problem, whatever the opposite of the problem is, is we didn't have to pay for this out of our own money. You didn't have to put in an hour's worth of overtime just to justify the D-Box fee. And so maybe we're going easier on these movies than we would have. I think it's one of those things like a 3D film. When Avatar came out and it was this new experience of 3D, it was different than it's been before. It was actually shot with these brand new 3D cameras. It's super fancy. Check this out. And nothing's been like it since, hardly. There's been a couple movies in 3D since that. But everything else, including Avengers and others, they're all post-film conversions where they just fake in the 3D. And it's just not the same experience. But, you know, I would say to everybody, if they had the chance... And it's obviously way too late for that now. Maybe they'll re-release Avatar at some point. Go and see Avatar while it's in the theaters and get the experience while you can experience it. And I would say the same thing with a D-Box. I don't think it's going to be around for long. Go and experience it while you can. But I don't think it would save a bad movie. It, Go no, to a movie not. that you want to see or that you've already enjoyed. Right. And just say, hey, do you remember when Hulk beat the crap out of Loki, and every time he hit the ground, we felt it. That was really cool. And that's the hard part, too, because you know it's only going to be in the most first-run kind of movies like it was for Battleship, and you know maybe next week it'll already be Men in Black, so you only have so much time to do that. You know, you see your movie, oh, I like this movie, now you got to go see it the next day in the D-Box, but give it a shot. It's not something probably you're going to want to do often, but it was fun once. I'm glad that we went and did it the one time. I don't think I'll do it again, but I wouldn't be upset to do it again. That's fair. And, you know, like when Avatar came out and these theaters started to make unbelievable amounts of money. Because remember, it played so long that the theaters got to keep 80%, 85%, 90% of what they made. And they didn't have to send the rest back to Fox or whoever made it. A lot of these theaters reinvested that money in 3D digital projectors and all sorts of stuff. And and it, it could be that with this Avengers money or Dark Knight money or whatever is a big hit this summer, they go, wow, we're going to build a whole new bank of D-Box screens or, or our, our theater needs the D-Box and now we can afford it. And maybe it'll be everywhere a year from now, just like 3D is everywhere now. Right. Even in the freaking dollar theaters, you can see the 3D movies, which I never thought would happen. So that's the sum up. Thank you to the folks that donated it. Rish wanted to curse your name, but even he can't. It wasn't that bad of a film and it wasn't a bad experience. You know, we'd recommend everybody try it once, but you're not likely to want to do it many times. It's kind of like riding a roller coaster or something. You know, you go and you do it for a day and then you're done. Oh, I disagree. I could go on roller coasters over and over and over and over. You know what I mean? It costs a freaking buttload just to get in the park. Okay. You enjoy it for a day, but you can't do it over and over again because... Okay, because of the expenditure. All right. And it's the same kind of a thing. The D-Box is not as cool as a roller coaster, unfortunately, but it was cool. So that's uh, that's what I got to say, and I'm done. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rish Outfield. Mahala. <laughs> that Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Boy, they must really think a lot of themselves. I'll say, what do you want to say? And you go where you want to go. I was kind of going to take a back seat and let you run with it because I have very, very little to say. But it's... Uh, Wasn't that the flight of the Navigator that was flown by Pee Wee Herman? Or did he, they both he was the robot there too? It's been like t- 
Yeah, 20 years, I'll bet. 20 years. Unless you went on it when you went to Orlando. Oh, no, I didn't. I don't. Well, did I? I don't know. But yeah, I know I went on it in uh, 91, maybe. 90. Long time ago. Uh, the, the deal with Star Tours now, which just blows my mind, is that it's randomly programmed one of three adventures every time you sit down. And so you don't know if it's going to be like a prequel era adventure or if it's going to be like like the Endor one or if it's going to be like whatever classic original trilogy adventure they're having now. Huh. Um, and I can see, you know, that's good for that repeat cool. business uh, like you wouldn't believe. Well, let me just say mother and then you can put an explosion on it. It's all right that you went. Pff, I'll know to put an explosion. Oh, on. OK. I just want to say mother a little more clear. You I'll didn't say, say I'll, mother. I'll say it just in case you need to. Mother. Okay, we're done. <laughs>